Scientist webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and will serve as the host and moderator for today's webinar. The webinar is entitled Bipolar Disorder, Harnessing Brain Plasticity for Improved Overall Outcomes, presented by Dr. Husseini Manji, a member of our Scientific Council and a Vice President at Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceutical Research and Development. Before we start, I just want to um, say that on behalf of the Foundation, our thoughts are with the victims, the survivors, and the loved ones who suffered through the tragic events in, in Boston yesterday. I hope that all who have experienced the stress in this and all those who are the loved ones of those people will reach out for help from mental health professionals. And I also encourage people to keep an open dialogue with children and address their fears. Um, with that, let me say a few words about the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. The foundation is dedicated to funding research around the world to identify the causes, improve treatments, and ultimately develop cures for mental illness. The foundation is awarded approximately $300 million in NARSAD research grants over 25 years. I'm delighted that we have Dr. Manji today. Dr. Manji is the head of the neuroscience therapeutic area at Johnson & Johnson. Prior to that, he was the chief of the laboratory of molecular pathophysiology and experimental therapeutics at the National Institute of Mental Health. He is also a visiting professor at Duke University. Dr. Manji leads a preclinical and clinical global team whose broad goal is to discover and develop new therapeutics for major brain diseases. His research has helped to conceptualize severe neuropsychiatric disorders as genetically influenced disorders of synaptic and neural plasticity. Dr. Manji received a NARSAD Distinguished Investigator Grant and the Foundation's Falcom Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Effective Disorder Research. That prize has been renamed the Colvin Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Mood Disorders Research. He actively serves on the Foundation's All-Volunteer Scientific Council that identifies the most promising ideas to fund with NARSAD grants each year. This will be an interactive event. We will begin with Dr. Manji's presentation, followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab of the webinar control panel. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation. As your moderator, I will present your questions to Dr. Manji, and we will address as many as possible. And now I'm pleased to present my colleague, Dr. Husseini Manji. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Bornstein. Hopefully you can he hear me, and I am just putting my slides on. I hear you, and I see the slides. Great. Okay. So um, thank you for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's really my pleasure to be here today. Um, discussing what I think is a very important topic because as I'm sure most people on the line know, bipolar disorder and mood disorders in general really are often you know, very devastating disorders for which we need to work collectively to come up with better treatments. Um, hopefully the slide is advanced and this is just an introductory slide. Again, I think most people on this line are, you know, may well be familiar with some of this data but some people outside this field often are surprised to see the data. This is a slide that basically um, summarizes the findings from the World Health Organization Global Burden of Disease Study. What they attempted to do is quantitate the disabling nature of all illnesses affecting humanity. And the way they did that was to try and look at how many sort of years or days do you lose from work because of you know the, um, the disabling nature of certain illnesses. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you see the data from um, North America and Western Europe that in the 15 to 45 or 44-year age group, they found that mental illnesses by, were by far and away 
the leading cause of disability compared to you can see all the other diseases noted there, cancer, cerebrovascular disease, respiratory disease, etc. And sometimes people are surprised to see, you know, how could this be? And I think there's two big reasons. One is that the mental illnesses are actually quite common due to reasons like stigma. Often people don't hear about them or talk about them as much, but they are quite common. Um, the other big reason is that most of the ser ser serious mental illnesses, you know, disorders like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or recurrent familial depression often in hit people when they're very young, so quite often late adolescents, early 20s, and they're lifelong, so they're viewed as a chronic diseases of the young. Um, what's also shown on the left-hand side of the slide is not only are these diseases and disorders disabling, they can also unfortunately be fatal. So today we think that there are more than 35,000 people who die every year in the United States from suicide. That means that there's only three forms of cancer which have a higher annual death rate. So that is, you know, information that many people don't know. If you look on the right-hand side of the slide, it's something similar to what I mentioned on the left-hand side, which is then starting to look at individual disorders. Okay, so mental illnesses are the number one cause of disability when we start to look at all diseases individually. And there you can see they've identified unipolar depression as the number one cause of disability in the Western world. And the prediction is that by the year 2030, it's going to be the number one cause of disability worldwide. Bipolar disorder is also very high on the list, but it doesn't show up here because it's not as common as unipolar depression. But the reason I bring this up as well is that we know today that you know there are many patients with unipolar depression who will have one episode of depression, you know, often late in their 40s or so on after a specific um, environmental event. But many people who have recurrent depressions that start when they're quite young, many people believe they actually belong in a bipolar family in that they probably have some common genetics or pathophysiology and that, you know, for some reason they're not having the manic episodes, but they have something very similar. So this slide begs the question, if you know this unmet need is so tremendous, and it certainly is, why haven't we come up with, you know, better treatments? And I think, you know, sort of a, an answer is that it's really very, very difficult. And on the left-hand side, you see what is true of, you know, in general, the process of medication development. And as you heard from Dr. Bernstein, I was, you know, at the NIH um, for about 15 years until about four years ago when I joined um, Johnson & Johnson. And, you know, some of this was, you know, I knew, but I really got to know once I joined. So about 95% of things we try actually fail. And that, that's not just for psychiatry or bipolar disorder, but for any illness. It's so complex that you have to start out with a lot of ideas and then see if you can affect that molecule and do it safely and get into clinical trials, etc. So it's, you know, very complex um, for any disorder. Our disorders are arguably, you know, the most challenging that there are. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you see some of, you know, what at least I believe are some of the reasons why progress has been slow. The first thing is certainly the sheer complexity of the di our diseases and disorders. So, for example, the liver has three types of cells. The brain has thousands of different kinds of nerve cells that talk to each other, and they mediate such complex things like people's mood, people's emotion, people's ability to remember, pay attention, sleep, appetite, energy, etc. And then in something like bipolar disorder, you also have this additional complexity that, you know, the same person, for example, when they're depressed, can have their depressed mood, can be very slowed down physically, their thinking is slowed down, they've lost interest in everything, etc. And the same person, when they're manic, it's almost like the switch has been turned on. Their thoughts are going a mile a minute. They're full of energy. They're not sleeping, but they're not needing sleep. So it's difficult to conceptualize, you know, this illness. How could it be that you can have such, you know, complex um, clinical pictures? Um, so that's one of the problems. The second bullet on the right, you know, sort of moves on from that comment that it's very complicated to model some of these things in, in rats and mice. So often you have to do, you know, studies in rats and mice before you go into humans. And while we can make some inferences, okay, is the rat, you know, um, behaving like it's more anxious, 
or is it behaving like it's more depressed, etc. It's not the same as, you know, um, seeing if a rat has an infection and treating the infection because, you know, these things are just so much more complicated. The third bullet makes the point that, you know, when we say bipolar disorder, there's some people who have, you know, sort of one manic episode and then almost all their episodes are depressive. And we have other people who have, you know, mainly manic episodes. We call them all bipolar disorder. But clearly, the biology isn't the same in those two different examples I gave you, and we've got to come up with a better way of understanding, you know, what are the subtypes? Because it may well be that, you know, you're not going to come up with a treatment that works for everybody, but you may come up with treatments that work for some specific subtypes. The next bullet point says, you know, the brain is inaccessible. And what that means is that in, you know, many um, other diseases we look at, you can do a skin biopsy to see what's going on. Or if you're looking at something like diabetes, you can measure blood glucose in the, you know, basically in the blood, you can look at glucose levels, etc. For us, we need to study the brain and, you know, obviously you can't do brain biopsy, so you're left with, you know, different kinds of imaging modalities or, you know, um, ways of looking at with magnets or other things, brain function, but it's not the same as, you know, being able to just take the tissue and look at it. Similarly, you know, there's many advances in post-mortem brain research or studies in animals, but it's one of those things that it, there's no question. It is much more complicated to try and figure out what's going on in the brain when you can't look directly. But having said that, many people, including myself, think we are actually making many advances, and so there's reasons to be optimistic that we are going to come up with, you know, much better treatments. Some of them might be sooner, some of them might be later, and I'll get into that. But what this slide shows is the headlines from the leading journals, um, basically leading journals, period. So these aren't the leading psychiatry journals. These are the leading scientific journals in the world. And you can see, at least from these headlines, many of the people, you know, in the journal editors, etc., believe that, you know, we are making a lot of progress in our understanding of the psychiatric disorders, so that hopefully we'll be able to come up with some major breakthroughs, as the slide indicates. And I'll touch briefly on some of the advances we're seeing before we get into um, specifics about bipolar disorder. What this slide um, shows, and many of my um, colleagues in other medical disciplines are sometimes very surprised to see, is I think just about every illness we deal with, you know, whether it's heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, bipolar disorder, has a contribution of genes as well as environment. And this, question, this slide attempts to ask the question, of all the illnesses we deal with, which ones have the strongest genetic component? And one way to try and um, come up with that answer is to look at twins. And in the green bars, you see something called dizygotic twins. And that means that the twins share 50% of, the, of their genetic, of their DNA. Um, and so you can ask the question, okay, if you've got one twin who has, you know, bipolar disorder and another twin who has 50% same genes, what is the chance that they'll get bipolar disorder? Similarly, you can look at, in the blue, what's known as monozygotic twins. So these are twins who share 100% of the DNA. And so you can ask the question, okay, if one twin has bipolar disorder, what's the chance that the other twin will also have bipolar disorder? and use that as a way to say, okay, you know, um, can we separate what is the genetic contribution from the environmental contribution? And you can see on this slide compared to things like breast cancer, chronic lung disease, hypertension, heart disease, major mood disorders are by far and away the most genetic of these illnesses. So they clearly have a strong biologic basis to them. And as I said, you know, sometimes people in other fields of medicine are very surprised to see this data and, you know, I think this is very important for us to keep in mind that these are very strongly genetic and therefore biologic. That doesn't mean that, you know, we shouldn't pay attention to environmental factors. For example, sleep deprivation can be a real trigger in bipolar disorder. Or as I'll get into, you know, we need to think about more than just medications to treat these conditions. But it just shows you that there's biology is a big part of it. This slide just talks a little bit about some of the advances in neuroscience. And on the left-hand side, I think what we've really learned a lot about is that the brain is so what's known as plastic. So, for example, you are going to remember much of this seminar. You know, you may not remember every single thing I say, but you'll remember quite a bit of it. And what we've learned recently is that the brain is actually changing 
you know, in its structure so that you can, you know, make this information permanent. And we're now able to see that in animals. At, on, on the bottom left, you see something called neurogenesis, the birth of new neurons. We used to think that, you know, you're basically born with a certain number of nerve cells and then, you know, it's downhill from there. They go, you know, they die, but they don't regenerate. Now we know in some parts of the brain you can have the regeneration. Um, on the top right, you know, C, basically showing you, and this is just, isn't just rats and mice. In humans, we've made a lot of advances to show the connectivity between different parts of the brain, um, as well as sort of trying to understand what the function is. And then at the bottom, you know, if, as I said, a lot of, you know, sort of learning or illnesses relate to changes in brain structure and function, can you show that in people? And this is showing you, you know, a sort of a slide in, in, um, at the bottom right-hand corner where they have sort of undertaken a treatment and shown that after the treatment, the connectivity between the different parts of the brain is enhanced. So these are lots of great advances. This slide shows you something that has been called the method of the year about two years ago. Very uh, brilliant work from Carl Dyser at um, Stanford University. And basically today we know that most of our illnesses really arise from problems in specific circuits. But one of the challenges we've had is how do we manipulate those circuits in animals so that you can then see, okay, how do I correct the circuits? And until recently, we had basically had to inject a toxin to, you know, sort of destroy that circuit, et cetera, and it's very crude. What Carl Dysart was able to do is come up with a way where they can genetically engineer animals that, you know, are sort of completely, behave completely normally, and then when they shine a light through a fiber optic cable to a very specific part of the brain in a specific circuit, they can turn on or turn off certain nerve cells and look at what the consequences are. So the slide you're going to see on the right-hand side in a moment is basically a mouse that is going to be sort of kind of just walking around. You can't see the fiber optic cable, but there's a fiber optic cable that's going into its brain. You'll see this blue light turn on on the mouse's head, and that's basically when this light has been turned on. And you'll see that the mouse basically is going to start to basically run around in a counterclockwise way because this gene has been put into a circuit that is known to regulate this sort of movement. So here you see the mouse just walking around. Then the blue light will come on in a moment. But it's on. And now you see that this mouse sort of has almost no choice but to keep, you know, running around in this counterclockwise way. And then when the light goes off, the mouse will stop. And so the objective isn't to, you know, sort of make mice run around in a counterclockwise way, but they've done similar work in, you know, to try and make mice depressed and then, you know, see wh which circuits are involved and how can you treat them. This is probably one of the areas that we think is one of the sort of biggest areas in terms of coming up with new treatments is in terms of our understanding of what might, might be going wrong in these illnesses. So on the left-hand side is, you know, sort of the old model where, you know, we sometimes talk about, you know, a serotonin deficiency in depression. So this cartoon shows a psychiatrist, you know, pumping serotonin into the person's brain. Now we know on the right-hand side that it's much more complex than that. It's about regulating what I mentioned, sort of plasticity, changes in brain structure and function in specific circuits. And what you're seeing in the movie on the right-hand side is that we know a lot of the ways by which these plasticity changes occur is by the movement of these things called AMPA or NMDA receptor subunits that you're seeing you know, sort of running around in that cartoon that seem to really strengthen or weaken the information in specific synapses and circuits. So this could be the information in a specific circuit involved in mood or anxiety or memory, etc. So that beg, beg the question, is, are these things involved in our diseases and their treatments? And so about 10 or 15 years of work was done where you can kind of, you know, try and make rats and mice depressed and then look at whether these plasticity molecules, AMPA or NMDA, on this slide is shown with the red circles, do they change? And in fact, they change, you know, robustly when you made animals depressed. And then the, sort of the flip experiment was done is what about when you treat them with our traditional antidepressants, do these molecules change? And the answer was yes, and they change, and they change in the opposite direction.
So that led to the hypothesis, as I'm sure everyone in this call knows, we have many antidepressants today, but many of them don't work too well. You know, they work for some people or, and not for others. And a big problem is that almost all of them take weeks to work. So this data here suggested that maybe one of the things the antidepressants are doing is increasing the levels of these neurotransmitters, serotonin or norepinephrine, but then these neurotransmitter changes have to go through a lot of different steps inside the cell before you bring about changes in NMDA or AMPA receptors. And could this be one of the reasons why antidepressants take so long to work? And if that's the case, if you directly affected NMDA or AMPA receptors, would you have treatments that work rapidly? And would you have treatments that work even when other treatments didn't because you're bypassing a lot of these steps? And a lot of animal studies suggested that that was the case, but obviously want to show it in humans. And here's some of the human data. So on the left-hand side, this was um, data that was generated by my, myself and Carla Zarati at the NIMH. And Dr. Zarati is going to be speaking in this session in the coming months. So I'd encourage all of you, if you can, to attend it. And so these were people who had failed at least six different antidepressants. Some had failed electroconvulsive therapy. They had been continuously depressed for three years by the time they came to the study, and they were given either intravenous placebo or very low doses of an NMDA antagonist. In this case, ketamine was chosen at doses that are very low, so it you know, doesn't produce many side effects. And it was remarkable to see that starting at about two hours, these you know, severely depressed patients started to get better. And at 24 hours, if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, almost 70% of people had responded. And on the extreme right of the slide, um, and you know, it, it's just showing you sort of response rates with traditional antidepressants. So with traditional antidepressants at about eight weeks, in patients who are not treatment resistant, you see something like a 60 to 70% response rate. In this study, at one day, you saw 70% response rate in people who had failed six different trials. These results looked remarkable. These findings have been replicated in multiple independent studies. As I'll show you, the same effects are seen in um, major depression and in bipolar depression. And it's been replicated to some extent with a few different molecules, not just ketamine. So that leads people to think it's quite real. One question was, you know, is it really targeting the core symptoms of depression? Or is it just making you kind of feel good? And you know, it clearly seemed to be targeting the core symptoms of depression. And what's shown on the left-hand side of the slide was even something as profound as suicidal ideation. So the, um, on the left, you see in the red, people who had a very high suicidal ideation score. Amazingly, within sort of an hour, that got markedly better. And with a single dose of this, um, this drug, it seemed to be maintained for about, at least about nine days. So these findings have encouraged a lot of people to think that this might be a completely new way to treat depression, things that work in um, people who other treatments haven't worked in, work markedly rapidly, and maybe even have this rapid um, anti-suicidal effect. And um, as with most research, you know, we'll have to sort of see if that holds up. But this might be one of the things that could be, a, you know, in the near term, in the next few years, three years or four years, it may be that we'll have medications that are approved by the FDA that sort of work through this mechanism, and hopefully the data I've shown you so far, you know, holds up and that the medications are safe and effective, et cetera. On the right-hand side, you just see one slide of, you know, we had hypothesized that this might be working through this AMPA synaptic potentiation, and you can see on the right-hand side that anyone who responded really showed the synaptic potentiation, so the hypothesis seems to be true. As I mentioned, the very same effects were seen in bipolar depressed patients. And the only difference in the study is that, as you know, um, individuals who, are bi who have bipolar illness, if you treat them with an antidepressant, some of them might become hypomanic or manic. So what is often done is you maintain people on a mood stabilizer. And in this study, people were maintained either on lithium or Depakote. And then they were, give then they were given this low-dose ketamine. And the results were almost exactly the same. If anything, bipolar patients seemed to respond faster. And um, when you sort of kept them on lithium or, or Depakote, they didn't, um, you know, you didn't trigger a manic episode. So as I said, these are very exciting findings. And the hope is that, you know, if this is a traditional way antidepressants work, and clearly, 
you know, it's not that there's no response for four weeks and then suddenly you go up. You know, clearly there's some graded, graded response. Hopefully we're going to be in a position to, you know, markedly come up with something markedly better that treats immediately and then you can try and maintain. One of the other areas that I think is, you know, getting a lot of attention recently is related to this slide. So we've known forever that, you know, we sometimes talk about the brain and the mind as being separate from the body, but they really are connected and the brain controls everything. So it shouldn't be too surprising that if you have a brain illness like bipolar disorder or severe depression, that there might be effects on the rest of the body. And a lot of data has turned out to show that that's the case, that if people have, you know, um, recurrent depression or bipolar disorder, they have an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes, increased risk of obesity in either pre- or postmenopausal women. You see an increased risk of osteoporosis. And what you tend to see as well is a higher likelihood to develop heart disease. And then the outcome after heart disease is also unfortunately worse. And certainly, you know, some of this may be because, you know, when, when people are depressed, Perhaps they're not exercising as much or um, their diet isn't as good, et cetera. But some of this looks like the illness does something that contributes to the risk. And the something that the illness does, many people think, is that um, it sort of turns on this inflammation state that you can measure in the blood and molecules like IL-6 or TNF-alpha, et cetera, you can show in patients are markedly elevated. And I think there's good reason to believe that those things contribute, I'll just go back for a sec, those things contribute to the heart disease, to the bone, to the type 2 diabetes. What we don't know is whether those things called neuroactive cytokines, are they also contributing to the depressed mood? This slide shows you an example, and I'll draw your attention to the middle panel, where you're looking at the levels of some of these neuroactive cytokines, at the top is something called interleukin-1-beta, and at the bottom, TNF-alpha. And you can see that either major depressed patients or bipolar um, patients have almost a double in the levels of these neuro neuroactive cytokines. And I call them neuroactive cytokines because I don't think bipolar disorder or major disorder is brain inflammation. I think that some of these molecules also have important brain function. And so what you're seeing at the top is very elegant work from Rob Malenka at Stanford, where he's shown that this molecule TNF-alpha really affects these AMPA receptors that I talked about earlier for moving in and out of the synapse and their function. And it almost looks like, you know, you need a little bit of TNF-alpha for the system to work properly. But if you have too much, the system stops working. And at the bottom of the slide is very elegant work from Ron Duman at Yale or Scott Russo and Eric Nessler at Mount Sinai, where they've made animals depressed and then given medications that block certain neuroactive cytokines. And in all these three cases, they see that they do see an improvement in the depressive symptoms, suggesting that maybe treatments that target these neuroactive cytokines could work. At this point, we don't know if that's true in humans. There's preliminary suggestions, um, some of it shown on the slide. So on the left-hand side was a study from Ranga Krishnan and his colleagues at Duke, where basically they took a, a large group of people with psoriasis who were treated with a TNF-alpha antagonist called Etanercept. These were people who had psoriasis, not depression, but they also measured their depression score and then ask the question, does the Tenercept also help your depression score? And as you can see on the left-hand side, compared to placebo, um, the Tenercept seemed to help their depression score. But I think one obvious you know, concern is, well, wouldn't your mood get better if your psoriasis got better? They attempted to control for that, but that's you know, sort of a confound in the study. On the right-hand side, you see a study from Andy Miller and his colleagues at um, Emory University, where they took people who had major depression. So they did, these weren't people with psoriasis, and they treated them with another TNF-alpha antagonist, if, infliximab. And what they found was if you look at the group overall, you didn't see a clear benefit of the drug over placebo. But if you separated the group into people who had what looked like high inflammation in the periphery versus low inflammation in the periphery, the people with the high inflammation in the periphery 
tended to respond, which might suggest that there's a subgroup of people in whom these pathways are turned on who are going to respond. And again, hopefully in the, next, in the coming years, we'll find out if that's the case. Clearly, one of the most important parts of bipolar disorder is the fact that it's a recurrent illness. And of course, we need to come up with better ways to treat you know, the depression here and now or mania here and now. But bipolar disorder has such a devastating effect on so many people because you have you know, these repeated episodes over your lifetime. And these repeated episodes not only take their toll on the brain, but they can affect people's you know, ability to... Um, in terms of education, in terms of working, in terms of relationships, etc. So if you can do something to prevent these recurrences, that would obviously be very useful. So there's been a lot of research going into, okay, what are some of the genes that you know, might be involved? What, when we look at postmortem brain, can we understand what some of these molecules might be? When we look at some of the treatments that we think work to prevent recurrences, what is it that they're doing? And one of the treatments that's, that's been chosen is lithium because lithium, although it's, you know, it's a very old drug and it's far from a perfect drug, so many patients don't respond to it. Many people have side effects. But if you look on the right-hand side, this is some work from Ross Baldessarini at Harvard. It basically shows that if you respond to lithium, you seem to spend almost four and a half times less time in mania so it markedly reduces the time you spent in mania, and it causes a two and a half time reduction in the time you spent in depression. And in his studies, it causes something like a six to 12 fold reduction in suicidal attempts um, or completion. So that suggested that you know, maybe lithium is working on something that can help prevent these recurrences. And if I to summarize something like 15 years of work, most of the molecules that turned up from these studies looked like they're molecules whose job it was to help nerve cells grow and survive. And that was initially surprising to people because, you know, bipolar disorder is not like Alzheimer's disease where you've got a lot of nerve cells dying. Could these molecules be relevant for bipolar disorder? You know, if one of the main things they do is help nerve cells grow or survive. And the answer appears to be yes. So if you look on the left-hand side, this is a study from Wayne Drevitz, um, published in Nature that attempted to quantitate, measure how much gray matter, and we think gray matter, it, it, you know, it basically comprises of the stuff that nerve cells are made of, and using a sophisticated MRI, he attempted to ask the question, the specific part of the brain near the frontal cortex, how much gray matter is there, either in healthy individuals or bipolar depressed individuals, or recurrent unipolar depressed individuals who, as I mentioned, you know, I believe, you know, belong into the bipolar family. And he was struck to find that there was almost 40% less of this gray matter in that part of the brain. If you look on the right-hand side of the slide, that's a cartoon um, from Eric Nessler, which I think paints sort of a good news, bad news picture. So when you look at post-mortem brain studies, you know, the first question is, why is this gray matter lower? Is it because the nerve cells have died? And the answer appears to be no, the nerve cells haven't died. But what seems to be happening is that the nerve cells are a little bit shriveled up. So if this is a normal nerve cell, you can see with a lot of these branches, this might be what the nerve cell from someone with you know, severe mood disorder might be, there's fewer branches. And if you look here, these things, these knobs, are basically what we call dendritic spines. They're the part of the nerve cell where one nerve cell or form a synaptic connection with the next nerve cell, and you can see that um, they've kind of shriveled up as well. So that suggests that these molecules might be relevant. One of those molecules is a molecule called BCL2, and the exact name doesn't matter, but you can see here that when you treat animals with you know, lithium for a few weeks, you see that BCLT, BCL2 goes up in various parts of the brain, and in animals, when you increase BCL2 levels, it protects against stroke and Alzheimer's toxin and a few other things. Is there human data? And Francis McMahon at the NIH did some genetic studies to show that there is a, ver a genetic variation in BCL2-2 that seems to be affect associated with bipolar disorder. And then the question is, okay, what does it mean to have this genetic variation? And if you look on the left, we all basically have two copies of every gene. 
and AA is the form that seems to be associated with bipolar disorder, and GG the form that seems to be protected. And you can see this um, in about a 40% increase in BCL2 levels if you're protected against bipolar disorder. Then in the middle, what you can do is you can take blood cells from people who have this you know, genetic variation and then try and kill them with different concentrations of a toxin. Um, and what you see is that if you have sort of the good gene, the GG version, you're protected against these cells dying. And then on the right-hand side, um, people have been looked at to ask the question, if you have AA or GG, does it affect your brain volume? And once again, if you have GG, which seems to be more protective, um, you have higher brain volume. So that suggests that, you know, if lithium or, you know, other treatments are increasing BCLT2 to increase, you know, sort of the, um, the neurons, connections, et cetera, does that really happen in people? If you look in the middle panel, it's taken a you know, large number of studies of bipolar disorder in people who haven't been on lithium for much of their illness or on people who have been on lithium. And you see that the people on lithium show this increase compared to the people not on lithium in the hippocampal volume. But this is just taking people and you know, doing a snapshot, asking the question, what's your hippocampal volume if you've been treated with lithium over the last few years or not? On the right-hand side, it's taken people off, bipolar people, off all medications, and then, I'm sorry, um, asking the question, if we put you on lithium, does your brain gray matter increase? And at least in this study, the part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, it went up after chronic lithium, but interestingly, only in patients, not in healthy volunteers. So it suggests that lithium is not acting like a brain fertilizer to, you know, sort of cause um, growth everywhere. It's only reversing an illness-related deficit. So you can genetically engineer mice to have more or less of these proteins. And when you do that, you find that if they have less of these proteins, they are much more likely to become depressed when you try and make them depressed. And that's shown on the left-hand side of the slide. But what's more important to us is if you increase, genetically increase the levels of these proteins, what you can see here is that the, in blue is these are mice with normal levels of this protein and you make them depressed, they remain depressed for weeks. The animals that you genetically engineered to have more of this protein, you make them depressed and within one day they've markedly recovered so they seem to be more resilient. And you see the same kind of things with certain chemicals. So this may be one of those types of areas of research that could lead to new treatments to help prevent recurrences in the long-term course of the illness, but this is not around the corner. This is probably many years away. I think one of the things I wanted to close with is something I started with is certainly bipolar disorder is you know, one of the most biologic and genetic um, illnesses we know. So clearly you need to treat the biology and a lot of that is usually through medication. But disorders like bipolar disorder, as I mentioned already, affect people's um, ability to function in school, at work, in relationships, etc. And so I think we need to think beyond the pill to really help people with all facets of their lives. And on the right-hand side, it's showing that you know, we may need to be thinking about some software or some psychotherapy-based approaches in addition to the pills that would help people with some of these things. On the bottom left, you know, can we start to pick up you know, um, signals, for example, through cell phones, that might give you an idea if someone is starting to become manic or becoming more and more depressed and isolated? Because if you could pick up those signals, hopefully you could send, you know, automatically send someone a message that says, look, it looks like this might be happening. Could you kind of nip it in the bud? And obviously we don't know yet. And at the top left-hand side is something we've been trying to do a lot of, which is try and put together patient care um, programs that you know, include medication but include much more than that, family counseling, work, rehabilitation, et cetera. And most of these right now are outside the U.S. just because the U.S. tends to be, you know, the healthcare system tends to be more complicated. And the early results suggest that indeed if you combine some of these things, um, the outcome can be much better. be pleased about that.
And then just to conclude, I think we also need to recognize that in our society, you know, often people don't have as much sort of awareness about these illnesses. So collectively, we need to do everything we can to reduce stigma in many parts of the world. The availability of healthcare professionals who understand these illnesses is very low. So we're attempting to really try and help train people who can help, you know, at least help others understand what these illnesses are about and try and get them the better treatment. So to conclude, um, you know, I think hopefully we've been able to talk about the fact that unfortunately these are very serious and often devastating illnesses. I think there's reasons to be optimistic that by targeting some of these plasticity cascades, we may be in a position to come up with better treatments. Some of those might be sooner, for example, rapid acting antidepressants, maybe in the next three or four years. Some of the things about, you know, preventing recurrences could take a while. As I said, I think we need to, you know, think about holistic solutions, that these are, you know, our shared responsibilities and we need to collectively work together. And then I think we need to educate society that there really is no health without mental health. Um, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Bronstein, who will um, basically facilitate the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Manji. That was a, an outstanding presentation um, on a complicated subject, um, but, but done in a, in a way that um, people could find accessible. And I could tell from the questions that there was tremendous amount of interest by our audience. And I'm going to jump in on a, a question that somebody asked um, related to what you brought up about repeated episodes um, and the effect on the brain. And the question that the person asked is, um, is bipolar disorder degenerative? Sure. I, I think that's a very important question. So degenerative generally, you know, sort of refers to the fact that the brain, you know, as I mentioned, is sort of shrinking or nerve cells are dying over time. I think the data is tending to suggest, and, you know, sort of um, there's some data from depression and then there's some data from bipolar disorder is tending to suggest that the more episodes you have, um, the worse it is. So, you know, some of these volumes you see in the brain, whether it's hippocampus or parts of this frontal cortex, they do seem to get smaller with repeated episodes. Um, I think so far the good news, and I realize you know it's only partial good news, is that the data tends to suggest that you know the nerve cells aren't necessarily dying like you see in Alzheimer's disease, etc., but they're shrinking and they're shriveled up, so they're still not working as well. But the fact that they're still there, you know, raises the possibility that with the right treatment, maybe you can reverse the shrinkage. There is data to suggest um, that having um, history of depression or bipolar disorder does increase the chance that you'll develop one of these traditional degenerative illnesses like Alzheimer's disease. And to me, that's unfortunately not too surprising because I think, you know, sort of bipolar disorder or um, depression basically really, really takes a toll on the brain. So it makes the brain more sensitive. Then if you have, you know, some of the other risk factors for Alzheimer's, etc., your brain is already more sensitive. There's data to suggest, you know, sort of the data is not, you know, clear cut, but Jules Angst in Switzerland and others have, you know, done some studies to ask the question, Okay, if lithium is neuroprotective, if you look at bipolar patients who've been treated with lithium for decades, is their chance of developing Alzheimer's lower than people who weren't treated with lithium? And the data is very dirty because, you know, as you know, many people are on many treatments. Um, so it's not just one treatment, people start and stop treatments, etc. But there is a suggestion that that might be the case that, you know, perhaps, you know, your um, likelihood of developing Alzheimer's is lower if you're one of these treatments that increases sort of neuroprotection, but it's not black or white. Okay. Um, let me just jump on the, the lithium issue because mm -hmm. we have a, a number of questions about lithium yeah. uh, in terms of concern or questions on the part of some people that their um, physician, their psychiatrist um, are... Uh, sort of say, let me treat you with some of the newer medications rather than lithium, which require less monitoring and have less side effects. Um, but it sounds like there are, you know, tremendous benefits as well to lithium, which 
we use, you know, we've used for many years. And I want you to sort of discuss that lithium question. Sure. So I think it's, it's again, a very, you know, good question. And as I said, you know, lithium is, you know, not a, a miracle drug. So for many people, you know, it doesn't work. Um, for many people, you know, there are side effects, so they can't tolerate it. But at least the available data would suggest that, you know, some of these, um, you know, brain protective effects, lithium has been the best studied and there's the most data for it. Is it possible that some of the other treatments also have it? So Depakote has been shown to have some, et cetera. It's possible, but there's almost no question that lithium has the best data. I think lithium has, you know, sort of fallen out of favor, um, partly because it does have, you know, sort of many side effects, you know, sort of often people will have tremor or they'll um, have to, they'll urinate a lot. Sometimes it'll affect the thyroid, et cetera. Then lithium needs monitoring because you need to have a very precise level in your blood and um, generally speaking, you know, people will need to get, you know, coming for a blood test. Um, but I happen to think that, you know, sort of the, the, the side effects are generally nuisance side effects. You know, sort of um, certainly if you're an artist, you know, the tremor would be a huge problem. But they're not, you know, sort of that bad if the drug is really, you know, going to prevent relapses, etc. Similarly, with the monitoring, generally speaking, when you first go on the treatment, you need to monitor relatively carefully. Generally speaking, once people are on a stable treatment, unless something happens to, for example, make them dehydrated, so if they get very sick or they go on a blood pressure medication, which is, you know, working on the kidneys, et cetera, that is going to, you know, affect the lithium levels, the monitoring is not as, you know, profound as, you, you know, some people think. So I do think that, again, you know, there's no guarantee, you know, lithium will work, um, but I think it's something that, the psychiatrist should certainly be thinking about because the data is the best with lithium. Um, you know, if you're responding to another treatment, fantastic. But if not, it should be at least, um, you know, in consideration. And one of the suggestions might be to, you know, and, you know, today in today's internet age, you know, people can get all kinds of information. So if you even wanted to sort of Google, you know, um, lithium neuroprotection or thing, you know, things like that, and perhaps, you know, sort of, um, take those things into the psychiatrist. Again, you know, I, I know every decision is a, you know, sort of an individual decision, um, and it might be that there's reasons to choose one drug over another, but to have the dialogue about, you know, should we consider this? And, um, you know, on an individual basis, it may be the right thing to do. In some cases, it may be the, not the right thing to do. Good, good. Thank you. The, another question relates to a, an issue you brought up that's very important across psychiatric conditions, which is the issue of physical health. Yep. And um, one question that, 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 that a few people have asked relates to, um, is, is the treatment of the condition, for instance, bipolar disorder, does that treatment result in um, a better outcome with regards to physical health? So if you get the bipolar yeah. treated, will you have a better physical health outcome? Yeah, um, I think a very good um, question for which there is only, unfortunately, a little bit of data. And again, um, I think um, Jules Angst in Switzerland, I think, has some of the good data and often these, um, you know, long-term studies. So basically, you know, the way you sometimes ask the question is if, you know, people have been treated with, you know, lithium for 30 years or not treated, is their, you know, likelihood of developing diabetes or heart disease, et cetera, lower or higher, et cetera. A lot of these studies are European studies because quite often um, they follow individuals, you know, for a long time. In the U.S., we often tend to move around a lot, et cetera. And some of the data suggests, yes, that um, in bipolar patients treated with lithium, um, it looked like the um, likelihood of, you know, sort of at least dying from one of these other illnesses was lower. Um, as I mentioned, unfortunately, there's, it's only been a slight more recent recognition about just, you know, unfortunately, how common these other conditions are. And um, David Kupfer's, you know, I think published a great paper talk about bipolar disorder and medical comorbidities. So now people are starting to ask the question a little bit more carefully, you know, does the treatment of bipolar disorder, how much of an impact does it have on these medical conditions? my, you know, sort of prediction was it's got to help because, as I said, you know, I think, you know, the brain basically controls, you know, everything, you know, sort of um, our, we have things called the autonomic nervous system, 
basically it makes, for example, blood vessels become tighter or looser, affects blood pressure, affects you know, heart rate, etc. We know that you know, people with depression or bipolar disorder, you know, when they're ill, that could be you know, out of regulation. So I think you know, if you sort of treat the bipolar disorder and some of these things get less, it's got to help. Um, that we don't have good data to show how much it helps, or is it that once you've, you know, you started the diabetes or you've started the heart disease, even if you treat the bipolar disorder, um, you know, you, that's not enough. Um, but I think a very important question, and I would certainly say that my, you know, my, my thinking is that you want to try and treat the bipolar disorder as well as possible, and then, you know, sort of try and address the other things, and it may be that, you know, you'll find that, um, you know, some of the other things, in fact, you know, is less difficult to treat, or you might find that, okay, you also need to treat the other things, but I would predict that if you treat the bipolar disorder well enough, you will have a better outcome in the other illnesses as well. Um, the, uh, I, I think that, that, you know, clinically, I think that's what we find, that yeah. it's certainly better to when somebody has ongoing care, and it's important. I want to shift a little bit back to some of the basic science information, which is extremely important. Um, you, you spoke about uh, neurogenesis and, and neuroplasticity, et cetera. Um, when, when you and I went to medical school, we were taught that old brains don't grow new cells and old meant after the age of four. Yeah. Obviously, we've learned a lot over the, the, the recent period of time. What do you see in terms of our findings about neuroplasticity? That's, that Where do you see the, the, the future? of research with that and the impact that this research will have on clinical care. Sure. So I, I think, um, you know, it, it, could, it could actually, you know, help in many different ways. So I think, in, you know, one of the things, as I mentioned, you know, with the, the rapid-acting antidepressants, so some of those studies were done because of, you know, sort of clinical observations, but a lot of those studies were done because, you know, um, these plasticity pathways appear to be very important. Um, and so the thought was, okay, if you can directly target them, could you come up with things that, you know, sort of work much more rapidly and better? So I think it's quite possible you'll see, you know, sort of some of these novel treatments coming from that. As I said, um, in terms of even, you know, sort of preventing um, recurrence, our data and others is tending to suggest that some of these molecules that, you know, sort of help um, nerve cells grow and survive um, might be the best ways to sort of make the brain and the person more resilient. I think um, that in these studies of neuroplasticity in animals, one of the things you often see is something called youth-dependent plasticity. And what that means is that, you know, it's not all the nerves. For example, I gave you the example that you might be, you know, you'll remember some of this lecture. So you're making changes in your brain to remember this lecture in specific parts of your brain parts of your brain which are involved in, for example, your balance, those things aren't changing right now. It's only specific parts of the brain. So this use-dependent plasticity basically says that the you know, specific parts of the brain are plastic under certain conditions. So I think one of the things that may happen in the future is that we might have some treatments which can help nerve cells with this plasticity. But then what we might do is use very low doses of that drug and then try and activate specific circuits. Those are the circuits upon which you want the drug to work. So you don't want to, you know, I think I used the term before, think of the drug as a brain fertilizer. It sort of, you know, affects plasticity everywhere because that might not be good. But you might sort of give a drug and then use something else. If something else might be software, something else might be psychotherapy you know, to specifically um, work on those circuits upon which the drug can work. Um, there's quite a bit of interest in things like uh, magnetic stimulation or different electric stimulation. So I think that may happen. And the last thing I, I will say on this topic is that, you know, I think, you know, I, as people may know, you know, people are very excited about stem cells. And one of the areas of excitement is that you can take, you know, for example, my skin or your skin and you can make it into a neuron in a, in a dish that then you can then study. So that's one of the good parts of it. But the other thing people are excited about, what about using stem cells as a treatment? And people are excited in diabetes and other areas. I think we may find that that might have utility for brain disorders as well. Not because I think that the stem cells 
are going to go into the brain and become part of your circuit. But what we found about these stem cells, so the stem cells are so these cells that are just, you know, beginning to grow, etc. They make a lot of these neurotrophic molecules. And so we think that these stem cells might be useful because they will make a lot of these neurotrophic molecules like brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And our thinking has been, if you can do that, then you're increasing the levels of these neurotrophic molecules and then you can sort of allow the brain to repair itself. Because if you, if you, for example, in an animal do a stroke or something like that, what you see is these levels of these molecules go way up. They're trying to treat the stroke. They don't do it well enough, but it almost looks like they're trying to recover. And our thinking is that you can use stem cells in this way. And so I think that could be an exciting part of this neuroplasticity story as well. Thank you. I want to just ask you, we, we had a chance to chat a little bit about it, um, the President's Brain Initiative sure. and your perspective on that. Sure. So um, I happen to think it's very important that, you know, so I, th I think the fact that President Obama has, you know, sort of publicly announced that, you know, the White House is reviewing, you know, the brain and, you know, the mysteries of the brain as one of the biggest challenges we face. Um, I think it's very important simply from a public visibility standpoint because hopefully it will mean, you know, more research, more um, attention, etc. But I think it's also going to be very important for us and, you know, um, there are examples that, you know, we've gone through. So, for example, when the AIDS epidemic hit in the um, U.S. and Western Europe, if you got AIDS, you were guaranteed to die within two years. Today, in the Western world, AIDS is an illness that you basically sort of live with. You know, the treatments have gotten so much better, um, and that's the kind of thing we need in our disorders. And when the AIDS epidemic hit, um, activists and other people were really able to put a lot of pressure on the government, and the government put a lot of, you know, research dollars that basically made a lot of people work together to come up with a solution. It made pharmaceutical companies work together. It made different researchers work together, including people who didn't care about AIDS, but, you know, there was research dollars. So I think that's going to be a very important thing. And I think one of the important things about the President's Initiative is that it's trying to develop tools and technologies that will help us all. So, I, you know, I think some people might be concerned that it's going to be this, you know, Manhattan Project that is going to tell, you know, this researcher at Harvard, you know, thou shalt study this, or this researcher at Columbia, you have to study this. And that's not my understanding at all. It's going to try and put a lot of resources to come up with tools and technologies. You know, I gave you that example of optogenetics, that mouse running around. That is a brilliant technology. There are, you know, a lot of advances being made in semiconductors and other things that will help us understand how the brain works. So I, I would regard this as a very positive thing. Um, some people are apprehensive that it might take away money from other important studies, and I think we all have to, you know, sort of try and fight that, but I would view it as a very positive thing, and um, my hope is that it's going to lead to, you know, a lot of advances, you know, probably not tomorrow, but if we can, you know, work at it together, we will get there. Thank you. Um, Dr. Manji, I agree with you that um, it's a very positive thing and the combination of that and uh, government support as well as um, private support for research um, is the best combination. Yep. Um, I want to thank you so much for your extraordinary presentation and more importantly for your commitment um, to research on the brain. Um, it certainly is an inspiration um, to me and, and to all of us. And I want to thank you, I want to also thank the audience for joining us today. Um, the foundation, um, our mission is to support research um, through our grants um, and the research is made possible through the generosity of private donations. Um, and I want to thank the people who have made those donations and let people who are on this webinar know that you can um, make a donation by visiting our website, bbrfoundation.org, or calling us at 1-800-829-8289. Um, this webinar has been recorded, so if you've missed any portion of the webinar um, or want to share this webinar with families or friends, 
you can um, visit uh, our website to do that. Um, I hope that people will join us next month when we hear from um, Dr. Helen Blair Simpson, um, the Director of Anxiety Disorders um, and OCD Research Program at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, um, a NARSAD independent investigator grantee. Um, and she will speak with us about OCD and anxiety, symptoms, treatment, and how to cope. That will be on Tuesday, May 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, I want to thank um, everybody uh, for joining us on this webinar and look forward to our next webinar in May. Take care, everybody. Bye.